and let's get this party started. So um, as Sarah mentioned, I'm Sonia Zamborski. I use she, her pronouns. And for those who might be visually impaired or calling in on their phone, I am a middle-aged 50-something white woman with long wavy hair, colorful side shave. I'm wearing my Sustainability Matters t-shirt and I'm coming to you live from my uh, living room, which has got some fun green lights in the background. So we're glad that you're here. Um, I have been encouraging people to eat their veggies since the early 70s. And as you can see here, serving up Prairie Luke's along the way, very stylish, very fa fabulous in the 70s. Um, I grew up in Eastern Pennsylvania and I gardened with my mom and my grandmother and I learned the magic of putting a seed in the ground and food comes out. Wow, that's amazing. So I'm now gardening in a small lot in suburban um, Falls Church outside the DC area, I'm inside the Beltway, but I'm outside the city. And uh, I have been really experimenting a lot with edible landscaping, which is a very fancy way of saying I grow veggies in my front yard and backyard and anywhere there's space for it. Um, and I really also have been exploring with the help of Sustainability Matters, how to incorporate pollinators and native plants to really support the, the wildlife that is out there and part of the ecosystem. So I am a big fan of getting my hands dirty, as you can see here, and um, work with the small space that I've got. And I wanted to share, um, if we could put it in the chat, that'd be great, that um, there is a study about how small gardens are just as crucial for bee conservation as big ones. And we like to think that, you know, like, I don't, I just have a little bit, I just have a deck, I just have a little bit of space. How is that going to make a difference? And actually, urban gardens are just as much a source of food for pollinators as these big meadows and larger spaces. And um, that no one single space is by itself going to make a difference, but it's a patchwork of spots for these resources for these pollinators. So it is really important, even if you've got just a little tiny bit of space to make the most of it. And um, as I like to say, eat your front yard. So let's dive in. Um, if you were with us last week, um, and uh, there is a recording of that on Facebook under the video section. Um, we talked a little bit about uh, this slide, which I like to say is why grass is bad, okay? <laughs> and so, you know, we've, there's a whole rundown of why grass is not the thing to have. It, there's a lot of it out there. It's invasive. There's no benefits. Um, it's got not, no erosion control. It takes up our time and resources. It's there's full of chemicals. It's the default, but it's not a great thing to have for us or for our environment. And really, you know, if we think about pollinators, we need them. If we don't give them the habitat that they need. They're not gonna, they're certainly not gonna pollinate our food and they're also gonna die off and, and impact the rest of the habitat. So it's pretty important to consider that as you're thinking about what to grow. Um, and I wanna invite those of you who happened to, to be with us last week to just put in the chat, what were your favorite takeaways? What did you learn? What really stuck with you? We're gonna be reviewing some of that material this week, but um, I really wanna hear what stood out for you. So let's talk about how to grow. Um, and we're gonna do a little bit of a um, basics on what types of gardens might you have. And um, I have all three of these and they, they all have their sort of pros and cons. Um, containers, great for small spaces. They're great for your balcony, your deck. You can put them on your front stoop in your driveway if you have one, it can go pretty much anywhere. And you can also mix them in with these other types of gardens um, to just provide a little bit of uh, additional support and different levels and de depending on what kind of space you want to have and how you want to curate your space. Um, you you will need to, you know, put get potting soil and ideally mix that in with some compost and some other elements. Um, sometimes potting mixes have a good bit of organics, but it's just nice, nice to add that in there. So, you know, you have to get the pot, you have to get the soil. It takes a little bit of time to sort of set that up, but you can move these around to maximize the amount of sun that you have. Um, you can have different sizes of pots. Different sizes will determine what is easier to grow in there. And we'll get into that in a, a little bit later on when we talk about veggies and, and herbs specifically. But containers are a really great choice if you don't have a ton of space. Um, the, the next one is raised beds. And um, this is a great way to use part of your yard where you don't maybe have soil to start with or you don't have a bed. You can put raised beds on paved surfaces if you have a liner in there. Um, you can make raised beds out of almost any kind of material. They, these are sh shown with uh, some type of lumber. Uh, you can make them with bales of straw. 
you can use other found materials and get really creative and kind of create these raised beds out of lots of different materials. And they will require a fair amount of bagged soil, compost, and all that stuff to kind of fill them in the first year. But once you get them started, they're pretty easy to maintain. And then there's just in-ground, just in the old ground, simplest way to do it. You may need to amend the soil that you have. If you're in the Northern Virginia DMV area, we have clay soil that is very challenging to work with. It's got a lot of great nutrients and it has its pluses, but it needs a lot of amendment to be workable. Um, and so that may be an issue. And also um, you can convert your grass uh, to either in-ground beds or you can put raised beds on top of them. And we'll talk about that in a moment. So the factors for success, this is not a small space. This is a pretty big space, but the factors are the same no matter where you're trying to garden. You need sun, you need to consider the, the water and the terrain. More specifically, as you're doing site selection, you really wanna make sure that you've got at least six hours of sun. You've got access to water, whether that is water from the sky or most likely will need to be supplemented at some point. We have long periods of drought these days. So you wanna make sure that you're near a rain barrel, a hose, a sink, some way you can get the water to your plants. Um, wanna make sure there's drainage, especially if you're gardening in containers, you wanna make sure that there's a way for that to drain out and that you're on a level surface. <laughs> Things aren't gonna go crooked and roll down a hill. This is a, a review of last week. We talked a little bit about the challenges of small spaces and um, just wanted to kind of go through this because it's relevant for this conversation as well. You might have a lack of space. You might have too little sun or too much sun in some cases. Um, you're likely to have chemical runoff. I know that I struggle a lot with the salt trucks that come out in the winter and just spray salt everywhere. And anything that's on the edge of the street or near my driveway just gets covered in salt and that is not great for the plants. So chemicals of all sorts are definitely an issue in our suburban spaces. And um, invasives are a huge problem. Um, raise your hand if you deal with English ivy. Ugh, it's the worst. Whoever decided that was like the thing that needed to default go in all you know plots of uh, when you're building a house, you put an English ivy and it just takes over and is um, not fun to get rid of. So <clears throat> vases come in all shapes and sizes. And we definitely have them um, around the Northern Virginia area and in small spaces that can be a real blight. You might have compacted soil. Um, like I mentioned, uh, we've got in zone seven and in, in the Northern Virginia area, a lot of clay, which gets mashed down. And particularly if you've got turf or you've got an area that hasn't had anything planted in it besides grass, or maybe it hasn't had anything planted in it and people have been walking on it with doing construction, it gets compacted down. It makes it really hard to, to grow in. And then of course the favorite, what will the neighbors think? Oh no, what if I plant things in my front yard? What will my neighbors think? Um, well, we, we'll, we'll talk about some ways to address that. So we've got challenges, right? We've got to be creative. We've got to come up with some workarounds. We've got to put our thinking hats on. Maybe they're not as sassy as this one. Maybe they are. I'm a big fan of accessories. So put on whatever thinking cap you need and we can come up with some workarounds for these challenges. They're listed here. We're going to go through them in a bit more detail in the, these, the next few slides. So the first one is you don't have space, well, make the space. <laughs> if you've got a lot of grass, guess what? Grass is bad, okay? We've just <laughs> determined that it's not something we wanna have around. Get rid of it. You can um, use this lasagna method that is um, pictured here to layer stuff on top of your grass, kill it, and then you can plant into it. And so the lasagna method is not about growing lasagna, sadly. I wish there was a way to do that, but <laughs> it refers to putting layers of brown and green materials, almost like you were composting right on top of the grass. So um, a common way to get this started is to put down a cardboard barrier. You can also, as we talked about last week, put down a plastic barrier to kill everything off. Um, whatever you can put down there, newspaper works, but you gotta put it real thick because it's gotta kill the grass and everything that's sort of in that first layer. And then you put down cardboard and you just layer compostable materials on top of that. So you can put dried leaves, you can put mulch, whatever is going to sort of weigh it down and water it and make sure that it's weighed down and then just continue to put layers. If you're able to put browns and greens layered together, then it's going to cook down a little faster, but just pile whatever you got there and um, keep it, make sure that it's watered and then just be patient. Um, sometimes it takes a while for the cardboard to break down, particularly if it's not wet enough. 
And depending on how, how thick the layers are, you're just gonna have to monitor it. Generally speaking, if you wanna start in the fall, you can usually have something broken down by the spring. Or if you wanna do something quicker, there's other ways to kind of shortcut that, but it does take some patience, but it's a great way to take either a big or a small space and just convert it into something that's gonna be a bed instead of grass. Going vertical, there's a number of ways to do this. Um, and you can, you know, you can buy fancy trellises. There's this one here. It's a little bit hard to see, but it's a, it's a, a wire trellis that you can walk through, makes a lovely way to plant squash or things over it. Um, you can buy all kinds of trellises and supports from any number of places online at your favorite garden center. There's a whole bunch of different options for that. Uh, bamboo is great. I don't know about you, but it feels like there's always somebody in my neighborhood who's trying to get rid of their bamboo and just cutting it all down, trying to get rid of it. And I picked up a bunch from a friend's neighbor last year and it's great. It's really strong. It comes in different sizes. You can lash it together like you see here to make a trellis. You can make a really tall teepee to, to plant beans on. There's all kinds of options for bamboo. It's really a great way to get vertical. And um, additionally, I don't have a picture of it, but you can also grow things with other tall stuff. So like if you've got sunflowers growing and you want to have pole beans grow up around them, there's a, um, there's a three sisters technique that uses corn and beans and squash together to support a, a small space. Um, that's an option. There's just ways to kind of use whatever's ha happening vertically and have plants grow around it. Um, the third option here is to just let it climb. And um, I have a funny story about, this is um, a little hard to see, but it's a loofah plant that my friend gave me seeds for a couple of years ago. And I was, first of all, very surprised to know that um, loofah, like what you use in the baths, you know, like if the spongy thing is not a sea creature, it's a gourd. <laughs> and it grows like any other cucurbit, um, likes to get real, real viney and grow. And so I put up a trellis, you can kind of see in the background here, thinking, I want to grow on the trellis, won't that be nice? And it did partially, and then it kind of took a turn and started growing across the side of my house and came across <laughs> one of the windows in the front. And I opened up the drapes one day and there was a loofah plant growing across it. And there's also one that grew up to the second story. You know, it's like, hello, I'm here, I'm gonna hang out. So nature will take advantage of whatever you put there and will definitely crawl up. And I've had loofah plants actually growing up both the front and back of my house, which is a pretty fun, funny thing to watch, but it's like, you know, they, they make, they figure it out, they'll make it work. So it's all good. The square foot method, um, which I'm not gonna get into a whole lot. You can Google it and find out all the details, but um, is a great way to utilize and maximize a small space. And it basically is just putting a grid, literally one foot squares, onto a raised bed or in the ground. And then you can decide what you wanna grow in each of those squares and maximize the harvest. So you can see there's tons of lettuce here. Lettuce doesn't need a whole lot of space. If you're growing something bigger, you might put one plant in there and you can plan out your garden by just figuring out how much space you have and, and again, maximizing it. So this is a great, great option to again, use either a raised bed or an in-ground bed. All right, let's talk about containers. Um, they are a great way to work with if you don't have ground to, to plant into or if you have a small amount of space. This is my deck from, I think it was about April of last year. And you can see there's a wide variety of containers here. Um, everything from these large pots that are kind of in the front foreground. I had a friend who worked, used to work in a bakery and gave me these five gallon pot containers. You can get them from Home Depot as well. They're great. Um, there's some recycled yogurt containers in here. There's some solo cups. There's some, there's a Wendy's near my house. Uh, we used to have band practice and the drummer would bring Wendy's cups every time. And I'm like, ah, those would be great for planting tomatoes into, um, and then transplanting them elsewhere. There's all different shapes and sizes of containers here. So you can um, really move these around. You can, you can see a little bit of a trellis that I use with some small bamboo on the side. Um, it's a very flexible way to plant things um, where there's sun. And in this case, there's a ton of sun on my deck. I'm going to try to make the most of it. Um, and again, if as much as you can reuse and recycle is amazing. This is a, 
<laughs> my partner doing a little bit of coopering in our um, front yard, we got a wine barrel from a local winery and um, had to borrow a friend's car because I have a, I literally have a mini. I don't have a lot of space <laughs> in my car either. So we had to borrow a friend's car, truck this thing back from the winery. And when we got it home, we realized that it had the top was still on. So we had to take it apart, do again, some coopering, take the top off, use, use a hammer, have some fun. And then plants in this thing. And this is a pretty big planter. So I actually put some materials in the bottom part of it to, because the plants aren't going to take up the whole space. So I filled it up about halfway with stuff and then about half with dirt. And it's sitting kind of in this picture on the right side of the driveway. And it's a great way to, to plant things into a space. And um, I just, I love that it's a wine barrel. It's very indicative of who lives in this house, <laughs> people who like wine and plants. So it's all good. Also, containers are a great way to, if you want, if you need to move them around, if you want to do some layering, if you want to work with different kinds, there's um, this green um, planter in the background, which our cardinal friend is, is hanging out at, is a self-watering uh, planter. It's got a reservoir on the bottom and there's a wicking bit that goes in there and brings the water up. And it also has a structure with some, I, I plant tomatoes in here and some other stuff as well. And it's nice because I can move it around if there's a space where I need to you know, get more sun or less sun if I want some shade. There's a lot of flexibility with containers and you can layer short ones, tall ones kind of together and, and maximize the space that you've got. You can also use small, cute versions, baby versions of things, which work really well in containers. And also they're just adorable. They're super cute. Um, this picture here, you, we've got some um, peppers that they're called Asheville Pimento peppers. And they don't get much bigger than, than, a, you, know, than you see here. Uh, they're small, they're cute, they're amazing. There's uh, these tiny little eggplants. Um, I can't remember the name of them, but they, they get to be about golf ball size or maybe a little bit more. And they do really well in containers. And they're just adorable. Cherry tomatoes are great um, for containers as well. They don't usually get quite as big. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about tomatoes and, and options in a bit. But anytime you can get a, a small, cute version of something, I'm a big fan of that. Companion planting, where you've got two different, in this case, we've got a couple different things in this picture. We've got some peppers in the front, some kale in there, and some salvia. And they're all mixed together and they all do well. They need the same amount of sun and water. So they, they're happy together in a small space. So again, you can maximize what you've got planted in, in the space rather than just having one or two things. You can have a variety diversity. Um, and succession planting is another great way to, to use the space that you've got. It basically is, if you've got, for example, in this picture, peas are growing in the spring. Uh, and then when it gets hot, they're like, yep, I'm out of here, I'm done. You can put tomatoes, pull the peas, put tomatoes in there. In this case, the peas will put fixed nitrogen in the soil. So it's extra good. Um, and then, you know, you can plant some more peas again in the fall if you want to try to do a fall crop. So having things go, you know, spring, summer, fall um, and rotate them out uh, really helps. Sometimes you might want to amend in between. And, you know, if you've got something that is a heavy feeder, you might want to put some, some compost in there or something in there to kind of reset but it's a great way to use that same space for three different vegetables. And then finally, winter sowing is a, an excellent way to get a jump start on this season. And um, this, typically people say you can use um, milk gallons. We don't drink that much milk in my house. So I tend to use those, those lettuce and salad containers, the plastic ones, anything that will, you can have a, a lid that comes off because what you do is you'll put the the um, soil in there, put the seeds in there, water it, make sure there's some good drainage, and then leave it outside all winter. And um, in the spring, when the plant has decided, oh, all right, there's enough sun, it's warm enough, it sprouts. And you, you know, there's, I think these are marigolds in the front here. You might have to separate them out if they get really clumpy, but um, it gives you a really nice head start. Those plants are already hardened off. They're ready to go in the ground. It's, it's super easy. And um, actually we are doing some winter sowing classes. So if you stick with us, <laughs> we can teach you how to do it. It's pretty simple, but there's some tips and tricks on how to make it most effective. So we will offer some advice on that. All right, before I get into what to grow, um, I will take a quick pause and see if we have any burning questions from our audience. 
I think we wanted a little bit of clarification from somebody on the milk bottles again. Um, and again, we're going to have, depending on where you're located, we're going to have some hands-on workshops in our area of Virginia um, this winter, but uh, yeah. Yes, so more to come, but in a nutshell, um, the way that the milk jugs work is you usually cut them in half <clears throat> so you can kind of pull the top off, plant, put the soil and plant some seeds in there and then put the top back on so it is a little bit of a like a mini greenhouse over the winter and make sure that you poke holes in the top so it doesn't get too wet and hot. Make sure you've got good drainage underneath so again, it doesn't get too soggy. Um, I actually like to poke holes and then put them in a tray so that they don't get too dry. So you do have to keep an eye on them. Um, the smaller the container, the more you have to pay attention to if it dries out or if it gets too wet, just like when you're growing things. But you basically sort of set it and forget it. You put these plants out outside and you just let them do their thing. They get covered in snow. They'll hopefully, you know, if there's not too much wind, they won't blow over, but you basically just sort of put them out and um, the, the plants will then sprout. And so like there's milk jugs are one example. This looks like maybe a takeout container. Those, um, those containers that like the rotisserie chickens come in are great because they have this sort of black sort of sturdy bottom and then there's a plastic top. So anything like that where you can cover it up and make sure that it gets a little bit of protection from the elements is great. Mm -hmm. So hopefully that answers Just your a reminder to people to put questions, please, in the Q&A. It just makes it a little bit easier to manage with a large group. Um, definitely keep chatting and chat. Uh, so clarification question, the screw top stays on or not? With yes. It looks like, I can't tell from this one, and I didn't take this picture, so I'm kind of guessing, but um, you want to keep them covered and um, punch holes and let the water kind of seep in in that way, but I wouldn't leave them open because it would probably get too wet. And somebody wants to know if lettuce seed will survive our winter temperatures. Um, depends on what kind of lettuce. There are some winter lettuces that will do very well. Um, most lettuce does not like freezing temperatures. So I would say as a general rule, no. But there is there are some um, they're, and they're labeled winter winter spinach winter lettuce that um, like the colder temperatures. So read the package. <laughs> and we are in zone six, ranging to seven, right? Those of us who are in the Shenandoah Valley are in six, yeah. and you, Sonia, in Northern Virginia are in seven, correct? Yes, that's right. For now, I think it's probably changing as climate change. <laughs> <laughs> changes oh, things, but yeah. yes, for now we're seven, seven A or B, depending on where you are. Yes. Um, and one other interesting question, and I think the answer to this is going to be, it depends, but is uh, what kinds of veggies are good to start in November? Um, well, it does depend on um, if you are trying to start them and put them outside. You can do um, some greens, and we'll talk a little bit about those um, things that have a short growing cycle. Uh, we de tend to, we'll see, it's different every year. We tend to have that sort of warm-ish weather. We don't have like a hard freeze until like January or February. So for example, I like to do um, broccoli and kale and spinach. I, I've started them already, um, and then I bring them outside or I put them in the ground in like September or October, but they will do really well through the cold weather. So do carrots and beets. Um, and in some cases, even a little bit of frost will bring the sugars out in the vegetables. So you get for kale example, for example, will taste better if it's gone through a little bit of cold weather. And sometimes it changes color, you know, so there's a lot of fun things you can do with winter gardening. There's, um, there's a great book on four season gardening. I think that might be what it's called that talks about what can be grown through the winter. And in some cases you might wanna put some shelter, do some row covers and stuff, but you can actually get a good bit of usage out of the last quarter of the year around here, at least because it stays relatively warm for a long period of time. You don't get as much sun. So you're, you're not gonna be able to grow things that fruit like you know, tomatoes, for example, that need warmer weather or need a lot of sun, but greens and herbs that can tolerate um, the colder temperatures um, are are good. And you know, there's some like rosemary and sage. Um, once you get them established, they're perennial and they will go gangbusters all the way through the winter. So I go out in the middle of the winter and snip sage <laughs> from my, my front yard like a maniac. <laughs> so that's something that works really well for me. 
we got a good tip actually in the chat about the milk jugs. Um, mm -hmm. A suggestion to cut them just on three sides instead of cutting them in half mm -hmm. and then folding the top over out of the way so you then have less of an issue with flyaway milk jug tops since they are still attached. Brilliant. So you just sort of so hinge that's it. an option, and, particularly yeah. if you're somewhere windy. Fantastic. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Keep those tips coming. Like I said, there's a lot of collective wisdom. I certainly don't have all the answers and we'd love to hear from you and, and what works for you because, you know, like with everything, your mileage may vary. And um, it's always great to hear suggestions from folks. So keep those tips rolling in. All right, should we sally forth? All right, <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about what to grow. We talked about how you might grow things, what specifically is gonna work. And again, your mileage may vary. These are just some suggestions that have worked for me. I would love to hear from y'all about what's what's done well for you, but let's go through some of the basics. So I always like to say, grow what you and your family like to eat. This is a shot of my nephew, Jack, um, from many, many years ago. He's now over six feet tall and he's still eating kale. So that's a winner for, for that family. Grow what you like, grow what you're gonna be happy with getting a bumper crop of. Do not zucchini bomb your neighbors. That is not okay. We do not support that notion. Uh, the one exception being if you do want to grow some extras uh, for your local food bank or with, for an organization like Hands on Harvest, who we'll talk about in a moment, then it's okay because those are people who are who are deserving and wanting your your extra stuff. But don't don't zucchini bomb your neighbors, or as I sometimes do, lettuce bomb because you grow all this lettuce and it's only you know you can't really preserve it, you can't freeze it. So I, I end up giving a lot of lettuce away. So be careful, grow what you like to eat, and be prepared to eat a lot of it if you do well. And also grow what works. You know you're going to have to sort of start from somewhere and try trial and error, but then take notes take notes on what's done well and grow those things again. And if you want to try to grow something that's really not meant to be in the space that you are, then just know that you're going to have extra heartache, but otherwise go with things that, that do well. I love to eat garlic and growing garlic is pretty simple. You know, you just pick apart the, the heads and put the cloves in the ground and you, you have garlic, but I've never been able to grow really big chunky garlic. And it's, to me, it's not worth the effort and the space that it takes up. I'll just buy it at the grocery store. So you sort of have to decide again, what you're gonna eat, what you like to have around, what's gonna do well for your space and for your microclimate. We have a lot of microclimates too, where you might be in zone seven, but that could be a wide diversity of options. So what works for your space and your preferences and then keep notes and keep doing those things. Don't make it harder for yourself than you need to. I have the Bernie gnome is gonna judge me no matter what, but in your case, Go with what's easy. So greens are the obvious choice. These are a bunch of different kinds of kale. I have a mild obsession with growing things that are purple, as you will see in these photographs. And so there's all kinds of lovely kale that are, they're billed as ornamental, but you can eat them. And the this particular kind actually gets more purple in colder weather. So um, it's just delightful. And if you have too much kale, you can always make kale chips. So that's a winner. Lettuce, spinach, kale, all really good in, in containers, in small spaces. If you don't quite have as much sun, they'll, they're more tolerant of that. In fact, they don't like as much sun um, charred as well. And then you can always do microgreens. You can do that inside or under a grow light. Um, and microgreens are super fun to just grow like broccoli, for example, sprinkle it on the dirt. You get these little tiny plants. They taste like broccoli but they're just this big so get creative with it and, and have fun with it and, and like I was saying before the lettuce and the spinach they lettuce doesn't do well past the spring or where I am at least I have about until maybe like Mother's Day and if I don't harvest all the lettuce it bolts it gets really angry and bitter does not like the heat spinach pretty much the same the kale for me grows year-round and actually um it tends to grow through one growing season, come back and then bolt, which it puts out with a little flower and the flowers are edible and they taste like kale or broccoli or whatever. So that's another way to get some great extra mileage out of your kale and collect the seeds and plant some more next year. Herbs are awesome for containers and spaces that again, don't maybe have as much sun, if that's a concern. Um, most herbs you can grow in a container 
I would say the exception is like rosemary likes a lot of space. You can grow it in a container, it'll just be small, but pretty much any herb that you can think of. And here's a few here, basil, mint, parsley, dill, and fennel, which is in the photograph with our, with our little caterpillar friend here, um, are great to have in, like I have, I grow a lot of herbs on my deck because it's right next to my kitchen and it's literally a kitchen garden. I can just go out the sliding door, pick a bunch of stuff, bring it in and cook with it. That's super handy and um, works with the, the space that I've got. I also have a lot of herbs in the front yard, particularly the perennial ones. I mentioned sage, parsley, um, oregano are all perennial and they'll come back, marjoram as well. Um, so there's lots of variety and you can make lots of delicious things with these herbs. Veggies, everybody's favorite. Um, lots of these will grow well either in containers or in the ground or in raised beds. Um, in some cases, like I said, it's better to grow a smaller version if you have a small pot, but you kind of have to assess your situation. So um, tomatoes, like I said, um, cherry tomatoes tend to work well. Also determinate tomatoes because they kind of grow smaller and bushier, they're more compact and they do very well in containers. Um, but I've grown all kinds of tomatoes in containers and you just have to give them enough support, stick a bamboo pole in there so they could climb up it. Um, peppers are awesome. Hot peppers, bell peppers, great for containers. Um, and you can move them around so that they get enough sun. Um, and I've been told, I've not tried this yet, but some people bring their peppers inside over the winter and kind of trim them back, bonsai them a little bit, and then take them back out for the next season. So there's some additional flexibility there and peppers can be very ornamental, particularly the hot ones. So they're pretty as well as being functional. Peas and beans, big fan. Um, bush beans as well as pole beans are great in containers in the ground. Whole beans, you're gonna need to give them some support, but they will climb and be, be friendly. I've had them grow into trees, nearby trees and <laughs> on other plants. So um, they're great. And I will put in a pitch for cow peas, um, also known as black eyed peas. They're really, they work really well in the increasingly hot weather that we have here in Northern Virginia. Um, and actually there's a great article that I pulled off the Sustainability Matters um, Facebook page that talks about crops that are gonna do well as the planet gets hotter. And um, I think there's five of them. And if we've got the link, if you put that in chat, that'd be great. One of them is cow peas. So they are um, very easy to grow. They do well with the heat of, you know, it gets to be August and everything is just like crispy and gross. So like, no, we got this, it's all good. And I am a huge fan of dry beans and making soup. And um, it's a great way to, to kind of keep, keep the harvest going. So uh, love beans and peas. And again, they fix nitrogen in the soil. So they're really wonderful for the other plants around them as well. And there's lots of different colors and shapes and sizes and whatnot. Squash, cucumbers, these lovely cucurbits, like we said, they'll, they'll climb. You need to give them some vertical space. You can get bush cucumbers. You can get smaller versions of things. There's also, um, I've gotten seeds for the gherkin, little tiny cucumbers. Those do well in containers in small spaces. They don't need a lot of space um, and they're pretty easy to grow. And so, you know, here's a couple other examples of things that, I'm, that I grow in my garden. Um, the top right is a fish pepper not because it tastes like fish, but because it is used to season dishes that are fish dishes and whatnot. Um, this one's really lovely because it's green and um, with like sort of white stripes. As it's ripening, it turns red and it's mildly spicy. It's like the jalapeno spicy level. Um, next to it is a shakamaxin pole bean, this little purple guy. Um, and not only is it just fun to say shakamaxin, but <laughs> the, these are have done really well. I have a huge harvest of these little purple dry beans to put in soup. And unlike a lot of beans that when you cook them, they kind of turn brown, these actually stay purple. So that's a bonus, it's awesome. Tomatoes, of course, everyone loves tomatoes. I do too. Here's a little bit of tomato porn for you. Um, again, different shapes and sizes. The smaller ones will work better in containers. The bigger ones will work better in ground, but experiment, see see what happens. If you give them enough nutrients, they, they'll do well in any kind of container or in ground. And then the last one here is um, globe basil, which gets this sort of bushy, like, you know, like a little round ball. Um, and it, 
just went gangbusters. I had a couple of these in pots this year and they were amazing. They're great for pesto because you can just hack off the whole thing and just put it in the blender and makes a great pesto. It's good to toss some of these leaves in a salad. Um, they're just really a very heat tolerant plant and very easy to grow. So I recommend them. Don't forget the flowers. We wanna make sure that we're growing flowers alongside your edibles to draw on those pollinators. Um, and also in some cases, flowers are edible themselves. These are some um, common ones, nasturtiums that are pictured here. Love them, love them. They, the flowers are edible, the leaves are edible. They're kind of peppery. The little seeds um, you can actually pickle almost like capers. Um, so there's, this is a very, very lovely plant and it's pretty easy to grow. You often find them in California, like by the side of the road. So they like really like hot, dry, unforgiving conditions. So um, you kind of get them started and they will self seed. And so they'll come back year after year. They're awesome. Borage is another favorite. Um, it, the, the flowers taste a little bit like cucumber. Um, and then the pollinators just love them. They're pretty, they're little purple, bluish purple plants, super fun. Marigolds are a big favorite of mine. They're very heat tolerant. I grow them along the side of the driveway where I have beds where it just is, gets crispy again by like middle of the summer where everything else is given up. The marigolds are like, yep, we got this, it's all good. And I have some that are still blooming now and bees are still kind of visiting them for some late season snacks. So, and I love to put them in salads. They really, or just sprinkle them on. If you want to plate something, do you just making chicken and potatoes? sprinkle a couple of marigold leaves on there. Makes it super fancy. Makes you feel like a gourmet chef. It's all kinds of good. So there's all sorts of, of plants that um, work well with your other the other things that you're growing and are good for pollinators. And if you can grow the, the native plants that are really very specifically good for pollinators, um, coneflower, is um, the, the purple coneflower is the one that's native. They come in other shapes and sizes, but this is the, the, the native one that's easy to grow and will come back year after year. Um, butterfly weed, which is a type of in the milkweed family, but it's, um, it's a smaller bushier plant and um, has these amazing orange flowers that will bloom all season long. And as you can see here, the bees love them. Butterflies love them as well. Um, and they they also will survive in the, the heat of summer where everything else is kind of crispy and not super happy. Um, and then, you know, common milkweed, which we want to grow for the monarchs. Monarchs love, love all kinds of things. We've got to grow all sorts of stuff for those friends. But if you, like me, get a lot of aphids on your monarchs, then you get ladybugs. So that's cool. And very happy ladybugs apparently here <laughs> doing a little mating dance, which makes me happy too. So all these types of things are really great for, they make your yard look pretty, but they also bring pollinators in and that will help pollinate your plants and give you more delicious vegetables. A couple of others um, that work well, zinnias. Um, I have some alfalfa growing in my front yard, which I got somewhere in a mix and it just kept coming back. And that also fixes nitrogen in the soil. Um, and stuff like Minarda is amazing, pretty, and the bees love it. Um, and again, it's a perennial, so you plant it once and you're good to go. So I'm gonna pause there and again, see if there's tips and tricks, suggestions, any questions. Don't think we have anything in particular. Um, there have been, you know, some great chat going on in the chat um, oh, with different ideas. Uh, but yeah, I, I think there's. Um, All right. Nothing we'll specific. Keep on keeping on. Yeah. And we'll get, oh, sorry, I missed one. Um, Fruits. Uh, I actually don't grow. I have some, a couple of blueberries and blackberries that I was given and um, they do okay, um, mostly for the squirrels and the birds, <laughs> but um, there are lots of dwarf fruit trees and um, native blueberries and blackberries, um, gooseberry currant. Um, you know, there's uh, persimmons are a great um, fruit that is native here that's, that grows as a tree. Um, so, you know, experiment again with the space that you have, and if you can get native cultivars, it's going to be a lot easier to grow them. Mm -hmm. All right, now <laughs> we are going to get into 
this concept of edible landscaping, which answers the question, what about the neighbors? <laughs> because if you have stuff in your front yard, if your front yard is where there's the most sun, which is the case with my house, then that's where you're gonna grow stuff. And um, you know, there's lots of ways to get creative and grow things in your front yard that are beautiful and fabulous and will make your neighbors happy and may, might have come over and ask questions about what you're growing versus making them angry, which we don't want. So this is a great resource. Um, it is kind of the, 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 the Bible, the tome, the reference um, for edible landscaping. Rosalind Creasy um, wrote it and it is a beautiful book. It is has lots of inspiring pictures. She talks a lot about how to create color, texture, mix things together, have you know tall and short plants. She gives lots of great examples. She talks about people who have um, replaced their lawn with edible landscaping. And in fact, I think there is an example from Northern Virginia, from Arlington, um, from one of those yards that's got the big slope in the front and how they, they redesigned it to be pollinator friendly edible landscape. So lots of great information in this book, highly recommend it. Um, and I think if we can put a link to that, you can, you can get it in Amazon or wherever you buy your books, but it, this is definitely one that's um, a great resource and very inspiring. So, you know, she talks about color and texture. We'll look at a couple examples here. This is sorrel, S-O-R-R-E-L. It is a member of the doc family and doc is a weed and not something that we normally like to have, but this is a very beautiful version of it. And um, it's got kind of a citrusy, almost like a sour taste. I put it in salads, you can cook with it. Um, and if you look carefully at this picture, you can see that it's growing right along the path, like right outside my front door. So it does not need a lot of space. It is a perennial. It comes back year after year. It can grow in the shade. It's amazing um, and beautiful and gives a little bit of that pop of color with the, the that sort of red veining. It's really lovely. There's just a handful of other fun, mostly purple <laughs> things that are here. Peppers, very ornamental, particularly hot peppers. These small ones are just really pretty and um, can be very spicy. So be, be mindful of the scovels, but they do really nicely in mixing in, in your front yard and they're kind of bushy and small. So you can put them in, in the front of the bed. Kale, um, it can comes in all different shapes and sizes and often is called ornamental, this kind of kale. It's like, you can eat it. I actually saw some in a big planter in Chicago this past weekend and almost stopped and like picked some to eat it. All right, I'm not gonna do that, but it is edible and it is lovely. And as I was saying, um, some of the, the, the types that have that purple color, the purple gets really bright when in the cold weather. So um, it's a lovely thing to grow wherever and doesn't need quite as much sun either. It's very forgiving. Um, on the other side, we've got some purple peas. Um, I grow a bunch of different kinds of purple peas. So I can't remember if these are snow or snap, but they both work really well on a little trellis come up in the spring and the flowers are purple and they're just lovely. And you can just pick them and drive up my driveway and just stop and pick a couple of peas before I go, go in the house. So it's fun, fun and, and delicious. Chive blossoms in the lower corner. Um, I love chives in my cooking and chive blossoms come out um, in the spring and sometimes they'll rebloom later in the year if you're lucky. And bees love them. I actually put chive blossoms in my salads, which is um, a little bit of a dangerous thing. You got to make sure if you're doing that, that everybody eats it because you get dragon breath <laughs> like you wouldn't believe, but you can um, pickle them. You can put them, you can make chive blossom vinegar. There's all kinds of cool things you can do with chives and they're just super pretty and they work in containers just as well as in the ground. And then in the middle, we've got marigolds, um, partially obscured by a lovely swallowtail butterfly, um, lots of different colors and shapes and um, super easy to actually have planting this, save some seeds and I don't know if you can see there um give them to friends and they will self-seed this particular it's like a bush it's a huge marigold bush just came back on its own this year so they will self-sow and, and come back um or you can pick the seeds and put them where you want them to be very drought tolerant very um low maintenance and very beautiful and lots of different again shapes and sizes they have tall ones short ones orangier yellowier this one's both both orange and yellow it's just they're great i am a big fan of marigolds and then we have the unexpected edibles. Uh, and we talked about this a little bit last week. 
about the concept of weeds in quotes because a weed is just a plant that's maybe not in the place that you expected. But for example, if you see, this is actually the small bit of sun that my backyard gets and it it's just gets covered by marigolds and dandelions every spring. And it makes me super happy because dandelions are not the evil that they've been made out to be by the chemical companies. Um, the dandelion greens are delicious. And by the way, if you get them at Whole Foods, they're like ridiculously expensive. So you get your own. Um, I put the flowers in salads and the root also can be used to make tea. Um, violets are amazing and they come in all kinds of versions and they're fun to throw into salads and to plate your fancy or not so fancy dishes as well. And they're also great for food coloring. Um, I have a friend who makes a violet shrub every year, which is kind of a vinegar uh, base drink. And then you put vodka and a little bit of maybe some soda water in there and you've got a delicious beverage. <laughs> so violets are fantastic and there is no reason to vilify them either and spray them with chemicals. Um, so there's other weeds that are um, that will pop up in various times of the year. Chickweed, very nutritious, very delicious. Um, you can, you have like winter cress, parsley, and there's a bunch of things that are considered weeds that are actually really tasty and um, not worth chemical bombing. They're worth picking and eating. Um, there's a number of things that have medical uh, medicinal purposes. Bone set is something that I learned about. I think it might've been part of a, a wildflower mix or something and I, I it kept coming back. And I just love the fact that it sounds like it should be part of a heavy metal concert. Oh, the bone set, yeah, it's great. It's very drought tolerant. It gets, they can get really tall brings the pollinators in um, and you can use bone set for, um, to make a tea, which I've never done. So I don't know how that tastes, but you can make tinctures. It's really great for cold and flu symptoms and, and that kind of thing. So um, a great thing to have in your yard. Goldenrod talked a little bit about um, last time as well. Yellow flowers that um, are usually a little bit later blooming and bring all kinds of, of critters and happiness and also make tinctures you can make all kinds of delicious things with with goldenrod that's good for you and good for the planet uh, mountain mint is a great option it's native um, it is a member of the mint family so it can overpower that which is around it if you're not careful it's better to have in a container if you can um, but really easy to grow and delicious in all kinds of ways and then saffron crocuses are definitely not a, a native but they're um, fun to grow and they um, I have I got some a couple of years ago and they they're fall blooming so it always kind of surprises me that like everything else has kind of died off and suddenly there's this purple stuff and I'm like, oh that's right the saffron crocuses so you have to harvest a lot of a lot of crocuses to get you know any kind of like huge amount of saffron but you know I have maybe a dozen or so and I have a handful of saffron I can make some nice risotto that's delightful so um, that is another sort of set it and forget it plant that I like a whole lot. And there's other stuff too. Echinacea is really great for making tea. Um, again, there's all kinds of edible flowers. Sunflowers are another great option. Um, so, you know, experiment, have fun. And these things can be beautiful as well as, as uh, delicious. All right, so let's talk a little bit about, if you haven't gotten started, how do you get the materials to to do this. Um, it's if you if you are able to and if you've gotten rolling, save seeds. Seed saving is a fantastic way to again something that worked really well, produced enough so that you've got seeds at the end of the season. That's going to be a good sign that it's going to do well again next year. And I believe we're doing some seed saving and some seed swaps for our volunteers and our members as well. So um become more involved with sustainability matters and you will get some fun seeds um if you're not in a place where you can we can reach you easily trade with your friends um or trade with people through the mail i've sent milkweed seeds to people through the mail particularly in the pandemic that was a fun like pen pal thing that i was doing real easy to to trade and um and also talk to your neighbors if your neighbor's growing something that looks super cool ask if you can get some seeds and grow that thing too because you know that it's going to work in your little microclimate in your, your neighborhood um you can also find an organization besides us there's also hands-on harvests 
Um, we were actually supposed to have one of their folks come and join us. There was a family emergency, unfortunately, but I also volunteer with them so I can tell you a little bit about their uh, their mission. They're a, a, an incredible organization that is teaching people to grow food and trying to increase access to fresh produce. So they do a lot of work um, in Fairfax County in particular with food injustice and the Urban Ag Council. They are doing a lot of community garden work and school gardens, working with immigrant communities to grow things that people were perhaps familiar with in their home country and let's try it here. Um, and so we're starting to work closely with them between sustainability matters and hands-on harvest to, to partner. Uh, they have a, a grow a row program, like I was mentioning before, where they get seed donations and you can plant, plant some things, plant some extra, and um, they have drop areas throughout the throughout Northern Virginia where you can drop off your extra produce and it all gets counted and collected. And at the end of the season, they're like, we donated this many thousands of pounds of whatever, all the various things they go to schools and um, community um, organizations and folks that are um, suffering from food injustice. So it's a really great way to, if you do have those extra zucchinis, <laughs> rather than giving them to somebody who doesn't want them, give them to a, an organization that's really going to do good in the community. So um, if we haven't already put their link in the chat, Hands on Harvest is a great group to get involved with and um, highly recommend that. Um, there's a few other places to go for um, native plant info. Um, plant Nova Natives is excellent. They are, um, as the name implies, based in Northern Virginia and focused on native plants that will grow well in Northern Virginia. They also do a lot of work around invasives and they have a program with, um, I think it's with the Girl Scouts, or at least the Girl Scouts were part of their marketing about like spot, oh, oh, there's an English ivy. Oh no, that person needs to know that that English ivy is invasive and go and kind of put a door hanger or talk to the the, the person that lives there and, and, and let them know this is, this is why this this item is invasive and why we should get rid of it, just in case you weren't aware. Um, so they're, they are a great source of info about, um, have great information on their website about what's going to grow well in this area that is native. Um, also Earth Sangha, it, they sell um, their plants, but they have, they do all natives and they do a lot of really great work with education. You can go and do like a, a native plant walk around there their facility then and see what's growing there. They do a lot of work with the clearing invasives as well. And um, and they also have native plants, seedlings for sale. So I love to support them. And then seeds, there's lots of places to get seeds. Um, and you may have your particular favorite. If so, feel free to put it in the chat. Um, my three favorites are True Love seeds. That's um, where I got those Jackamax and pole beans and those fish pepper seeds from. They're based in Philadelphia and they do a lot of work with reviving heirloom seeds that maybe have, you know, gone out of fashion or that they're not as available. And so the, um, the fish peppers, for example, it's a, a great story. They were brought here um, from the Caribbean by enslaved people who planted them and used them to you know cook with and all up and down the east coast they were super popular and then it kind of they fell out of fashion died out and true love seeds reviving the you know the handful of seeds that somebody saved and making them available to folks you can buy them grow them tell the story and they also donate a portion of their proceeds back to local organizations help them work on food justice and sustainability and all kinds of great stuff. So true love seeds, love them. And they have a very small catalog, but it's all pretty interesting stuff. So you can grow your own Shackamax and pole beans if you want. <laughs> um, Southern Exposure Seed Exchange is their local, they're in Virginia. Um, and they have some um, test and demo gardens in at their facility in Virginia. Um, and the nice thing is that they're growing things that are local to our state. Um, and they also do a lot of great education work and work with the community. So we like to support them. And then the last one is Baker Creek um, Heirloom Seeds. Their website is rareseeds.com. And they have the most beautiful catalog <laughs> ever. It's just the most wonderful thing to get this <laughs> seed porn in the middle of like winter where all you can do is just sort of fantasize and just sort of flip through and see they have really unusual really interesting seeds. They have some great stories behind them. They have great photographs in their catalog. And they also, they're they are not as local. They're somewhere in the Midwest, I think, but they do a lot of community work as well. So they're a great organization 
to be aware of. All right, well, I will pause and see if there are questions. We do have one good question. Uh, what are your favorite fertilizers? Oh, that is a great question. I am constantly experimenting. <laughs> um, my favorite is just compost is a great soil amendment um, under all circumstances. And so I have, I have a worm bin. I have a number of different compost things going on in my yard. I have one of those spinny tumblers. I've got piles. I, um, I just, I love the idea that you can just take your food scraps and turn it into something that's great for your garden. So I'm a big fan of compost and I try to use that as much as possible. Um, I also um, use leaf grow a lot and there's a couple of different versions of that, but that is, um, it's not so much a fertilizer as in a soil amendment, but it's, it's mulch basically that's, they collect leaves and turn it into this great um, amendment product that is available you know, at your favorite garden center. Um, I have tried a bunch of different fertilizers, um, preferably organic because the, the ones that are not orga organic are more likely to harm the plant if you don't use them in the right quantities. So you do have to be really careful, read the label, understand if you've got a small container, you don't need to dump all this fertilizer in there. It's going to fry the plant. It's going to make it very sad. Um, but I had it around for a minute. Um, Fox Farm, I don't know if you're going to be able to see it. Fox Farm, um, is one um, company that has a bunch of different, like they have one fertilizer that has more nitrogen. They have one for the blooming stage. Um, and there are, they're available like, you know, garden centers and whatnot, you can buy it online. Um, but they're a great sustainable company and um, have all kinds of great organic fertilizer options. I've tried the spikes that you put in the pot and the squirrels usually just pick them out and eat them. So those have not worked very, really well for me. Um, I've tried different kinds of liquids and solids and um, I, I don't really have any one particular kind that is like my go-to and um, Zoom team, I don't know if you have any thoughts on this for what you use, but I just like to experiment a lot. And I think different products work well for different circumstances again if you're in a container versus a raised bed and also for different whatever you're growing is going to have different nutritional needs yeah personally i tend to to go with compost and really would go with soil amendments as well uh it's in part because i'm a lazy gardener and with fertilizer you really have to calibrate it and yeah. unless you're going with the spikes or something You've got to think about it. You've got to remember to put it on. Whereas with compost, you can put it on whenever. Uh, just put down a thick layer and the rain, the water will just let it seep into your soil. Yeah, definitely. But if you're growing in containers, right, you have to think about this more because the, yes. there's limited opportunity for the roots to expand and get nutrients. It's true. And the more rain you get, it washes out anything that was in there. To begin with so you really do have to pay attention and um also if you're able to do a soil test that's the first thing so determine if you need fertilizer you might not i mean you probably do as you're first starting out and particularly if you're converting from what used to be turf grass you're going to want to you're definitely going to want to amend it but and also kind of determine all right is there is it lacking in this or that but people just tend to dump fertilizer on without knowing what's needed and that doesn't help at all that's just becomes runoff and it goes into the chesapeake bay and other places and it's harmful to the planet so do a soil test if you can um they're usually available if you know if you go to farmers markets there often will be a, a table there from the um the master gardener or the extension program they sometimes are at the libraries there's a number of places you can get these soil tests it's super easy you just scoop a couple of scoops mix together put it in a box it's like 10 bucks in virginia and they will send back more detail than you could ever possibly want to know about what's happening in your yard and what's what how your soil is, whether it needs to be amended with this, that, or the other thing, or not at all. And so that's a great way to just understand as a as a benchmark, like, all right, what do we need to put in there versus just dumping stuff in? And one of the good things about compost or drink compost tea, or I've made comfrey tea, which is from the leaves of the comfrey plant, 
is that you can't overdo that. That's not because they're natural. It's not going to be bad. You know, it's not going to hurt your soil. It's not going to end up polluting the watershed the way that the artificial fertilizers would. Yeah. The other thing that I like to do is um, it's, it's just recycled leaves, you know, fallen leaves and grass and, you know, add that in and, you have to be careful with grass. It can be, you can give too much nitrogen if you just pile it on and it also kind of gets matted down. So that's something that I usually mix in or or compost into something else, but it cracks me up when all these people are out there with their leaf blowers, which are their own <laughs> menace, um, blowing leaves around and then they just kind of blow back in and instead you can just run over them with the lawnmower, mulch them down. It helps your grass, gives it a little bit of a a bed for the winter and or put them on you know your beds that you've sort of putting to sleep cover them with leaves and water it down and that's a great amount of nutrient and protection for the mm -hmm. winter i have experimented with cover crops a little bit um those are another good way to um, have something happening with your bed you have to get the timing right which is a little tricky but you plant um like rye or um peas or there's a couple different options for cover crops and um they will put nitrogen and nutrients into the soil and then in the spring you just mix till them in and um, you've got you've got additional nutrients in your soil so that's another option um sort of thinking about ways to amend your soil and give back a little bit yeah there's a there's actually been a question going or a conversation going on in the chat about uh, sourcing yard waste for people who are not, you know, composting and who leave their, particularly in suburban areas, who are leaving the yard waste out there. Yes. How those of us who want it can get it. And we know that in Fairfax County, a county that we are working closely with, uh, their Department of Solid Waste has great programs where they turn it into leaf mulch and that is available for free to residents at the landfills. Mm -hmm. um, yep. We hosted a party at their landfill recently, uh, planting our Making Trash Bloom project, pollinator habitat there. And the uh, hosts at the, you know, the landfill administration was kind enough to let anybody who wanted to take away uh, some leaf mulch. But many municipalities do have programs like this. So it's definitely worth checking to see if you can if you can get free mulch of some kind. Um, mm -hmm. to have it in. It's so, a good way to recycle. Um, I have been known to um, take my neighbor's grass clippings on occasion <laughs> and repurpose them. And unfortunately, I don't have a large enough vehicle, as previously discussed, to uh, go out there and collect a large amount. <laughs> but the county, thankfully, is doing it. And they do a pretty good job of um, collecting the leaves, turning them into leaf mulch that gets sifted and it's in pretty good condition. And it's a great amendment in the spring, throughout the growing season, at the this end of the year, when you're trying to sort of put the beds to rest, cover them up. If you wanna do that lasagna method, calls for some mulch, that's a great place to get it. So um, yeah, definitely recycle as much as possible and reuse what's out there. And in Fairfax County, it's pretty easy to do. Well, I wanted to mention um, some of the resources that we have available, um, of course, on our website um, and follow us on all the socials. Um, we've got a garden calendar up there that kind of has plant harvest timelines and, you know, your mileage may vary depending on what zone you're in. I believe that was created for zone six, so it would have to be adjusted a little bit for our area, but not too much. It gives a good guideline of what's supposed to go in when and and kind of experiment with that a little bit, but it's good to I like to say if you at least know the rules before you break them, that gives you a better chance of success. So um, this will give you some sense of what what should be planted when. Um, as Sari mentioned, we've got Making Trash Bloom, which is our flagship project, which is planting pollinator meadows on closed trash cells. And um, we're now in three landfills, most recently in Fairfax. So I my local dump um, at the I-66 transfer station. And it's super exciting because that um, that facility gets a lot of visitors. So we'll have a chance to plant in a big space, have big instructional signage that shows people what's blooming when and reach a larger number of people about the importance of pollinators and planting for pollinators. So very excited about that. And then, as I mentioned, we've got um, our past webinars 
It's a great number of them. They are on um, Facebook, the raw recording um, in the video section. And then we have some finished, a little bit more um, polished <laughs> versions of our videos on YouTube. Um, we've got a little bit of a backlog, so they're not all up there yet, but they will be eventually. And then there's some other videos about our various programs. Making Trash Bloom has a great video there. We had a whole Preserving for the Perplexed series that's got videos. So um, be sure to check us out and please consider becoming a member, volunteering. We've got lots of great programs and perks available. And um, as somebody who got involved with Sustainability Matters, during the pandemic when everything was virtual and I was pretty far away from <laughs> where they were doing like Falls Church and Shenandoah, not necessarily neighbors, but I got involved virtually and found it to be amazing and rewarding and met some really cool people that whom I have actually met in person in real life, some of them. So lots of opportunities, no matter where you're calling in from uh, to get more involved and help our mission. So we would love to have you on board. And with that, fantastic. Yeah, and Sonia's gonna put up a, a poll, I think, uh, um, yes. just our sort of end of event poll, but just reiterating thanks to all of you for coming. Also some special thanks uh, to uh, the supporters of this program. This is actually connected to our Making Trash Bloom project in Fairfax. Uh, we are doing these small space sustainable landscaping webinars with a particular focus on the DC area, Northern Virginia audience. Um, and we're very grateful to the Community Foundation for Northern Virginia for their support of that. So we hope you enjoyed it. We hope that you will join us at future Sustainability Matters events and maybe get involved with us as members or volunteers. And happy gardening, happy growing of all of these uh, uh, fantastic, um, fantastic. So, uh, yeah. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thanks for sharing your tips and tricks. We have a lot of collective wisdom, as I said, and, um, be sure to keep the conversation going on in Facebook as well, because we'd love to hear from you. So happy gardening. Thank Thanks you. Everyone. Cheers. Good night.